Hi everybody, I'm Kate Foggo and I'm with Julie Hurt and we are Making Light. So Julie and I were reviewing our list. We I, I wrote a list about stuff. We keep adding things to it and then we forget about things. We have actually covered a couple of them, but the list grows exponentially every time we um, every time we sort of discuss things. But um, so we got Julie to pick one today and she, what I had written was Nyla, who's my hen, and the free will of animals, but we'll open it up to the free will of animals. Just, just whatever that brings up. Obviously brought something up in Julie because she chose it. Yeah. So Julie, why don't you start then? Yeah, so I have been um, being a TA for some animal communication classes of late. And it, the- Teaching the, assistant. Say what? Teaching assistant, yes, thank you. And it has, um, it's just kind of resurfaced some of the things that we all learned at the very beginning and, and moving forward. And what was interesting was last night we had a lab for this class a lab, so a live webinar kind of thing where all the students could ask questions because um, everything's done on Zoom and as everything is done on Zoom now. Um, and a question of wild animals came up and I have had a lot of conversations, I guess, or encounters with wildlife living in Alaska. I had this whole chapter with moose, um, I have animal um, oracle cards that I'll use from time to time. So just like all of this type of stuff. So it was interesting because that very morning at, of, the, of the lab, I was, my husband and my stepson and grandson are here and they're all out camping. So I went out to where they're camping on the shores of Lake Superior. And on my way back, just because I went out to visit, I don't want to stay in an RV with three men anyway so as i came back neither does lucas by the way um but because <laughs> i asked him you know. lucas being the dog not another man shall we say right right he's my dog and he's yeah <laughs> who's it yeah anyway so anyway i was coming back from the campground and i like to we, there's a lot of country roads here and i prefer to drive slow because i don't want to hit butterflies i don't want to hit birds and i certainly don't want to hit a deer because there's a lot of deer here so and so I'm just always driving so, but I'm always enjoying the drive then when I drive slowly because then I can see if something's gonna come up. So as I round this corner, I see on, so in the States, our wheel is on the left-hand side where Kate lives, it's on the other side. So I'm in the left-hand side of the car and on the left-hand side of the road, I see a huge doe just standing there. So I slow way down. There's a car behind me and I'm learning to not care what people behind me think about my driving. I don't care, pass me. But I'm slowing down and I'm hoping that they see it, doesn't matter, but I see it. And the doe and I lock eyes. And she slowly, as I, as I slow to a halt, she slowly walks out in the middle of the road and she stands there and she just stares at me. And then she slowly, goes to the other side of the road and then she takes off. And I thought, oh my gosh, that was absolutely beautiful. And I reached out to the deer and I asked her, what do you have? Do you have something to tell me? Like why well, you just did that, it was amazing. And she said to me, you are where you are meant to be. And I thought, oh, that's amazing. Because prior to that in leaving the campground and coming and, and seeing her, I was, reminiscing about camping in Alaska where we used to live and how I miss those campgrounds because they're far more rustic and quieter and all these things. And this particular campground where my husband is, is actually more like that. And I was relieved to see it and happy and also thinking, oh, really wish we hadn't left, still wishing we were there, just kind of like, you know, kind of, and she did that in an effort to pull me out of my doldrums, if you will, and just say, you are where you're meant to be. I was like, wow, that was amazing. So I got to relay that in class last night for everybody that it just, these little snippets happen. So mm -hmm. anyway, that was just where it started. And I saw the Nyla and the free world of animal things. And I thought, oh, let's talk a little bit about animal communication today. So that's my story for right now. That's How about lovely. you, Kate? <laughs> oh, animals, 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 animals everywhere. Um, oh. I love my girls so much. So I've got three hens, as you know, Julie knows. Uh, Nyla. Nyla was the one and where that um, 
the subject had come from is that my girls are all expatriate hens, which means that they have been overbred to lay, 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 and they have a horrible 18 months of life where they're forced to lay in artificial light. So they normally the body would stop every um, year. They don't get to do that. And after 18 months, having been forced to lay consistently, they will eventually, the body will eventually shut them down. And then they have a break for a few months and then they'll start laying again. And the egg business is such they can't afford to keep them alive for that period of time. So they just kill them. It's just anyway. So there is a lot of hen rescue in Britain where a lot of these girls go on to other homes, which is lovely. And that's how we got these girls. Um, but a lot of them will obviously then go on to have problems, um, usually egg related. That's usually what gets them in the end because of the way they've been bred. So my girls, I think, are five, which is pretty good for expatriate hens. Most of them have average lifespan of four years just because of the health. Um, I've had a lot of problems with them in the past, but they all the three I've, I had five. I lost we lost one within six months, which actually even that's not bad. Most people lose one or two within a few weeks. It's a shame. And then we lost another one um, just as I was learning healing. Actually, I it's when Nyla was bullying Pink and Wambui was the sort of one between them, and Wambui was just a, a sweetie, and she she didn't fade into the background, but because she was never any trouble, I didn't focus on her and then she just died <laughs> I, was like, I fixed everyone else and then Wamba's just like died I'm like oh my god if I know I'm gonna help her I'm gonna heal her but I guess she played her part um and then anyway so they're on hormones now to stop them laying because this is the primary reason why they um die or get ill and um, and because if you remember what that title was about was because both Ella and Pink had both had trouble laying. Um, so they, Ella has been on hormones ever since she first got ill and I had to give her antibiotics. And it was so much trouble giving her antibiotics. It's so stressful for both of us. I was like, if there's anything I can do to prevent this happening. And then that, and it was because she'd had an egg crack inside her. And if an egg cracks inside her, they give you antibiotics in case there's an infection. And I thought, can't go through this again. So put her on hormones, then Pink. Um, I knew there was something wrong with pink because she has she was getting really heavy and she had a growth. And I just thought if I can stop the egg laying, at least that gives her a better chance because obviously there's a lot of energy goes into egg laying. So those two have been a homeless for a while. Nyla still popping them out probably four or five times a week. Loves it. Makes such a fuss, such a drama. She's so highly strung. Um, and when it came to renew them, I thought, well, maybe I, I put her on hormones because the vet said I should really. Um, because he knew I was the type of person who would because I had, <laughs> you know, it's all like, you know, they're getting on a bit, Kate. Um, so I had put her on hormones, but it really did dampen her personality. So I thought, well, maybe, and that's what that whole thing was about. Is do I let her do what she wants to do, which was lay, or do I insist that she follows, you know, that, that, that I'm in control of her and I, I think it's better for her health that she's on hormones. And that's what I went through and I had a I don't know if you read her, I can't remember. I know not, um, Maria read her, I had everybody reading her because I was getting her going, I want to I want to lay, I want to lay, I love her laying and she didn't want to go on the hormones. And um, so I let her. <laughs> and the first egg got stuck and we ended up in the emergency bed. <laughs> so, so the question remains, do I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I guess that's it. Is it do do we allow our pets to do what they want or do we do what's best for them? What is our role in that? I mean, I can look at it now and say it's actually best for me that I know she's safe. And the irony is that I was away, as you know, on the retreat. What I didn't know was that Nyla was coming into lay. I usually have them all lined up in my diary and I start muscle checking, muscle testing every week. Does she need a hormones? Because I want to get them before. They start laying because otherwise they go through a horrible molt. And I just dropped the ball on it, basically. And when I got back, I said, oh, yeah, she started doing that thing again because they go like this <laughs> when they're laying. If you stand over them, you know, Whoo! which is really funny to watch. It's called the rooster dance. But I've never really found a good clip on YouTube, but I, I need to do one. It's just yeah, um, yeah. it's so hard to film chickens. It's hilarious. They basically squat and stamp their legs like really, really hard. And it's a, a sort of like a submission to the rooster or something. And they only do that when they're coming into lay. And Gary's like, oh, she started doing that. And I'm like, oh, bro. 
I've forgotten. So it was a rush to her, the vet to get her. Because this time there was no question in my mind, get her on the hormones. I don't, it's not that I don't care what she wants, but I can't go through that because what happened was not good for either of us. She was in the emergency vet three times and I had to pay the vet to implant her on top of all of that. And it was about 600 quid all in. So I was like, we're not doing this again, Nyla. You're just getting on the hormones. So, um, so that's what that was about. So I guess that's what's difficult in our role now is now that we can speak to our animals. What decisions do you let your animal make? And what decisions do you make? Any comments? That's really interesting, huh? Um, I mean, okay, so from a do like dogs, right? Because dogs are my thing, chickens are yours. I would never, I wouldn't allow Lucas to run free where I knew he could get in harm's way. <laughs> it's tricky, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it could be. Oh, this reminds me, I have to tell you about the puppy behind me, but um, it could be, actually, this might be a good example because that's why it just popped in my head. It could be that if I, if that were to happen where Lucas would get away from me and something would happen, that would be, Lucas would have designed that in an effort to work with me on a lesson, right? So the fact that Nyla told all of us she wanted to stay off the hormones there was a lesson in it for you. So she was saying what she was saying. And there's, pro there's probably more to it than the yes or no answer, right? So there's that. But I'm reminded of the puppy that lived behind me. Lived that, a past? Mm -hmm, that would cry and cry and cry and scream and scream and scream. So the other last week, Wednesday to Thursday, something like that. I, Lucas and I were doing our daily walk to the post office because we don't get mail delivered here. We have to go to the post office and then he gets a bone and a little treat and he knows it. So it's this whole deal and we look forward to it every day. It's this whole thing he and I have. So we are on our way. My neighbor stops me and she says, did you hear last night at about 1130? We go to bed super early because my husband gets up for work and whatnot. Did you hear last night about 1130? the something get hit and I said no thank goodness it had been a hot night we had the air conditioning on so the windows were all closed and I also do believe my spirit team spirit guide team everybody around me like muffled my ears because they knew I couldn't I can't take that so she said the dog the puppy got hit by a car last night and I said, and I'm sorry if this, we should put a warning on this video. You've said about animals in distress, do not watch this video. So which I am, I am absolutely upset about animals in distress, right? So I, she said that, and she went on to describe things, which we, I'm not going to describe here, but anyway, but she said, yes, this animal, it got hit. Well, what was so interesting to me Right. Cause I tried to, th when I'm in those moments, I just, I immediately connected with my guide team just to like, okay, help me get, help me hear what she's trying to tell me, but help me understand what's going on. Because then they showed me that the week prior, Brad and I were taking a walk with Lucas. We do an evening walk and we saw a dog running alongside. There's a two lane highway that's behind my house here. We saw this dog, no, it's okay. Hold on. Two running beside the cars. And at first I thought it was, I don't know who I thought it was. I didn't know, I didn't think it was that dog that I hear all the time. But then when I got closer, I realized it was the puppy. And it was like, the car would go by and it would playfully jump at the car and then come back. And so, and then it sat in the middle, not in the middle of the highway, in the middle of the side road, which I was on, it sat and it looked at me and I go, oh my goodness, you're the puppy, hello. And it was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful puppy. And so I tried to walk up to it. And for some reason, I got really afraid not to go up to it, which is not like me. I'm like, any dog, woohoo, you know? So humans, yes, I'm afraid of the dogs. No. So I walked, I tried to, and I got really afraid. And I said, Brad, I need, I need you to help. I can't, for some reason, I'm afraid. And he's got upset with me, whatever, anyways. But he ended up taking over, walking the dog back to the house. The guy that owned the dog was outside. And he said, how'd she get out? And Brad said, I don't know, just she was playing with the cars on Highway 41. You need to, you know, he's like, okay, was well, he took her away. 
come to find out her name is Hades, which is, I think, Greek for hell or something. Hades. Hades. Hades, H, I don't know. I have to Google it, but I do know it's the Greek, God, something mythological, but it does mean hell. Anyway, and people who are watching this are probably going, yes, and they know, and they can put comments in, which would be great. Anyway, so that was the week prior. So as my neighbor is telling me what's happened, I'm like, oh, the dog was show. That's why, first of all, I was afraid because it was like, don't, I'm not, was not to establish a relationship with the dog, which I had been warned about with my guides and everyone, right? Going for it was like, don't, you know, you're not here. The dog's here to teach other people a lesson. Your lesson here is that you're, not everything is up to you. So anyway, so fast forward, telling me about what happened. And that, and so then I connected with the dog as she was talking to me and I knew the dog had passed, but I also knew at the same moment, the dog told me a little bit about the lesson that she was working on with her owner about. So I hope that that has resonated, has sunk in. Now, of course, no one's talked to me and I'm not, you know, about going over and going, Hey, I'm an animal community now. That would not be prudent. However, but there was a reason why all this happened. There was a reason why I lived here and experienced that. There was a reason why I didn't hear that thing happen. But anyways, but the, the dog has passed away. How the dog was out at 1130 at night is also really strange because typically they're home by 930 and the dog's inside the house. So how it got out, I don't know. But clearly there was something that the dog was trying to teach them. So free will, I believe, painful, absolutely. You know, but, yeah, not necessarily good. Sorry, that totally brings you down. But I, yeah, I'm not, it's, yeah, I'm not. I'd rather relieved that the puppy is no longer here because it was very hard to hear it cry every single day, scream, actually. Um, I just, I do hope there's not. And just to <laughs> clarify, not because it's being mistreated, but because it was being, it felt ignored, presumably. Yes wasn't being mistreated but it was it's funny isn't it that, that once we have all this knowledge um you know because I think this is all part of me I suppose um still I think we discussed this with the cacao ceremony you know that I like to think that I'm bold and brash about what I do but I'm there is a bit of me that still um holds back with some people um, I have been healing the farm dog. This is Yvonne, the farmer, who, and she's a lovely little collie called Molly, who's just not been, she thought that she'd just lost interest in, 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 in the sheep dogging, but actually she'd actually been quite ill. She's had liver problems and stuff. So I've just been giving her Reiki. So we've had sort of snatched conversations and um, she's very interested. Um, but it's it's how far do you take that so she's fascinated by it but we we never really get a chance to chat it's always sort of on the way somewhere or something and she's been so busy lambing and that we did actually chat the year before covid i went around and had coffee and that so hopefully we will again um but it, she said that she had another sheep dog um and it wasn't she's trying to train it up because molly's just not that into it anymore she wants to go there and be with yvonne all the time but doesn't should I be changing names? <laughs> no, you're fine right now. Don't worry. <laughs> um, and I thought she was saying how the new dog was big, um, what's the word, responsive to men, but not so to her. And she was having difficulty building this relationship. And then I was thinking about it after. It's like, I really want to go just send her a wee text so have a look at my website and, and see what I do. You know, maybe an animal communication thing would help. Like, I know she's open to it. But it, again, so that's one thing. But then when you talk about the soul level animal communication, you're then going a lot deeper again, aren't you? This isn't, you know, I love the red ball. You know, mommy gives me salmon. This is, you know, I'm teaching you to love yourself. Or, you know, it, it, it's, an, it's another level of trust that I'd have to have with someone before I mm -hmm. talk to them about that. And also I don't want to be seen to be pushing anything on him. But I'm like, it's like, this, you know, this is right next door to me. There's someone that's close to me you know they're lining up opportunities for me to go I can help and I just but then I also think you know she could ask she knows sort of what I do I don't want to I don't want to give my stuff away either I mean I I, I heal her dog because it sort of came up mm. um 
but I, I really it's mostly the Reiki at night and I just say if you want to come in come in and nine times out of ten Molly comes in mm -hmm. she's such a sweet little dog you know it doesn't it's not taking me any time or energy or anything like that mm -hmm. and and Yvonne's fascinated by that but we haven't really talked more but you know there's so many opportunities now where I want to go there's there's more going on here you know but it, it, it is hard to realize that all these things that animals do they've done it through choice they they're suffering well they're all doing it through choice yeah. all the suffering that we see mm -hmm. is an animal that has chosen mm -hmm. to 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 be in a role that is in some way helping some human mm -hmm. i mean i think i think what it doesn't satisfy for me knowing that is is you know there is still the 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 real life 3d animal is still suffering you know that suffering is still real it's just that in the bigger picture it's happening for a reason that doesn't change the um agony i feel as we all do when i think of an animal physically suffering right although that is something else we were going to talk about as well and that that is that without the emotion behind pain is there suffering what we imagine it is because i don't think it is i've come to the conclusion that um if i look at suffering and i take the emotional aspect out of it it's just pain mm. you know it's not even when i feel pain usually what hurts more is all the emotional implications that come with that when I think of pain and suffering, when we're talking about the lambs, for example, it's not that they've got a broken leg. It's that I'm thinking he can't keep up with his friends. He's going to get left out. He doesn't understand why he's in pain. Nobody's helping him. He must think nobody cares about, you know, that's all where the pain comes from, not actually the leg at all. Right, right. Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking or getting, I was being inspired <laughs> while you were talking. Um, the attachment that we have to how we think the world should be when everything that we have experienced as animal communicators is that they chose this life they are um to to work with us on for a variety of reasons and they also live in a very in a in a state of presence they're not necessarily attached to whatever outcome because they are here so the 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 case or the argument can be made that they operate for human in in human definitions they operate at a higher level um you know the, the level of unconditional love and being present the the other thing then and then that's why our attachment to it doesn't really resonate with them because they're like well i'm here for a different purpose you think you have to be the protector of everything when in fact what we really need to be is understand our integration with everything we've kind of lost that ability to see our connection to that larger natural world and that larger web of life we feel like we either own it or have to protect it or whatever so we've separated ourselves from it and the animals are all working to get us back into that integrative sense where you know we can see a bird and just oh look that's the bird and oh here oh look it's telling me the weather's going to be bad day or i don't know whatever but you know it just depends on what's going on and you know just much like you hear with um you know the celtic people or native american populations that had that really strong tie or still have that strong tie with the natural world that's what the animals are really trying to help us and there was something else about oh and free will too i wanted to say you also inspired me to just comment real quickly on free will as it pertains to humans yes we everybody everything every living thing has free will there's always repercussions from what you decide and the and that to me is where the animals because they're living in the present moment and they've met you know they've had their plan as they've come into this life and then live in the free moment to move us forward we sometimes can misinterpret free will as I can do whatever I want. And that's, that's it. Well, there's always consequences. And that's something I feel like humans are also learning from animals is that you have consequences. Yes, you can absolutely make that choice. Absolutely. And when you do this, this, this can happen or this, 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 you know, there's always consequences and then you have the opportunity to go from there. So I don't know why I had to say all that, but there you go. <laughs> Well, I, well, as you were talking, it reminded me of I had a conversation with someone I will not name them. Um, 
who I had been looking at, is it Iwanda, the drug, um, Ashwanda, something like that. It's one of these drugs that people take to enlighten their... Oh. Um, Ash, Ashwanda. Anyway, it's one of those. But... Um, you can leave it in lady, the comments if they know. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, um, it was a lady who had taken um, magic mushrooms. And she said that the experience she had had was just, I would say this was in a very controlled setting with people that she trusted, blah, 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 for the, um, and with someone who was experienced in, in taking mushrooms. But she had said that what she had got out of it was just the, um, I don't want to say insignificance of us, because it's not that we're insignificant, but we are just, just the, the, the vastness of the world and how, what a tiny, 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 tiny part we are of this. And she said it had resonated and she was still feeling it several weeks after this that and seeing the trees breathing which I think is amazing but um and it brings us back to this idea of you know when you say that animals are completely and utterly in the presence because when you are in the present and not looking at everything else you, you know there is a trust that this whole world you know I don't, I'm not expect, articulating this very well but um if you live entirely in the present and are therefore not attached to the future, I think you have, a, you know, you go along with stuff because you're not trying to force the situation, you're not trying to control anything. Uh, there is another point to this, and I seem to have lost it completely, but it's all to do with the sort of the vast, oh, that was it, that, that when, I, when I was suffering with the lambs and, that, and I'd looked up that um, quite an old chat with Abraham Hicks about animals and that it, it being that animals are here, purely to help humans for our enjoyment um, and it, and but also for their beauty and to teach us lessons about but also you know just to help with animals and plants or life here to, to enhance our experience um, but there was also this talk of later somebody had said well how can an animal choose to come to earth you know to be eaten to go into a hen egg factory to do all these things you know and it, it's also the same question that people have is like, why, if we choose our destiny and we choose our life here, why would you choose to come here and be disabled, for example? And the answer that Abraham gave, gave in, in the case of the people was that actually, if you come into this world with a disability or a certain condition, it may actually free you up to be a person you would not have been able to do. And that's really fascinating, isn't it? Because from our ego perspective, like, why would you choose to be anything less than perfect? Why didn't I choose to be a, a beautiful blonde bombshell, six foot four? And, you know, uh, you know, why would you choose to be in a wheelchair? And it's like, because certain obligations, having a job, earning a living, uh, all these things, you know, you are, you are living a different experience. And it's only our egotistical selves that see that experience as less than. Mm -hmm. um, and you think of, for example, of all the children with Down syndrome and that, and I, I don't think I've ever read a story about any of them where the parent didn't say this is the most loving child I have ever had or the most happiest child I've ever had, you know, because it frees you up to a completely different. And likewise, Abraham says with the animals, you know, she basically she sort of says, stop messing with them because there was people, I think I've been on a, it was a whale cruise and there was this lady saying, you know, I love animals and that, and it really worries me that humans, she's like, stop. Hey, don't start, you know, you guys, you humans are so messed up. Don't start that with the animals. Just let them be, you know, admire them, be, you know, because there was, sort of, you know, there's this desire for us to dive in and try and fix things for animals. And, and she's like, you know, the animals are fine, leave them alone. And the animals choose to come and be part of the food chain. Mm -hmm. That is what they do. They know what they're signing up for. They know what's ahead of them. That, that's not to say that gives us carte blanche to be cruel to them, obviously, when they're here. But like she said, and then in this latter one, is their experience is different. It's very different. And I really want to know, though, um, you know, when we think about pain and suffering and stuff like that, I, from an animal's perspective, if you are not living in the emotional side of your pain, how that experience must be different. I might have to write a thesis on it. You what? Say that last bit again. I'll have to write a thesis on it. You need to write a thesis on it. Yeah. You're, when you were talking, you were reminding me too of, um, I mean, for the animals to come into this life and know that they're going to be eaten or whatever. Like, yes. Well, most of them are. I mean, unless you're an apex predator, every single one of them will die. Right. Um, probably well, for food. Yeah. And that's 
to me, the way that I, the way that I've experienced is because they realize they're part of the greater yeah. web uh, of yeah. life. That was the point I couldn't get. No, no, no. You, I, no, thank you. You did make it. I just didn't remind me. I just wanted to call that out. The other thing that it's reminding me of, though, is the, um, yes, human cruelty to animals. Well, there's two things. One, there's human cruelty to animals, and two, there's climate change. So human cruelty, well, actually, they're kind of combined if you think about it. Um, human cruelty to animals is the animal, you know, we've had classmates that really, really struggle with the idea of this dog will like willingly chose this life yes because it had to um teach the human something and it's this notion of co-creation that we are mm -hmm. here having an experience to help the divine and everything continue to grow and create and, and evolve and all of it everything that's why we're all tied together which is um why like which climate change so previous to all of this work I was signing all the petitions. I was like, got to protect the earth, got to protect the earth, got to do our thing, got to do this thing. And I still absolutely believe that. However, it has taken a nuance. Instead of protecting the earth, I feel like we need to be a part of it because, and because when we are, we will see what is happening. And it's really the only thing we're working to save is the human species because earth will take care of herself. Everything else will take care of herself. Mm -hmm. It's us that will not because we've been so disconnected, which helps me when I, which helps Julie the human, when I see the mass die off of whales or wolves. La, 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 la. I didn't know about that. Oh, well, yeah. So, any, you know, name any species. You see walruses. Haul. I mean, from Alaska, I had far more connection to this because it was part, it's very much part of how you talk with your friends. The first thing we would talk about in Alaska was, oh, where was the last brown bear sighting that you had? Or, hey, I saw a moose on this trail in King Cape Park. Like, it's all part of how we were, which was wonderful. And that's, I really missed that anyway. However, that when knowing, being, seeing all these things that are happening in the natural world, they're the animals, and I've heard this from a variety of people as well as just seeing it too, they're, the animals are going through these big things to get us to wake up, to see that we are a part of this, that when the bees disappear, food could be at risk for us. I mean, we there's bigger, bigger things that keep happening because everything's trying to get us to wake up. And we, I think we are waking up just maybe a little slower than some of us want. Again, that's attachment to an outcome for me, but it's just, it's, when you look at it in that perspective and it's just like they just want us to be a part of it it's mm -hmm. fast it's humbling and it's fascinating and it it does actually motivate me even more and i hope others too but it's actually motivating me to share this work with others so that maybe we this is part of our part is to help people see hey you know when you're when you you know you can save factory farm chickens hey you can save you know save or whatever that's probably a human word you can work with factory farm chickens you can work with rescue sled dogs you know who will break your leg for different reasons <laughs> you know just it's it's it is fascinating it's just fascinating well it's fascinating though is I, I i don't know if it's a cultural thing i think the americans are much the same but certainly in britain our ability to love and animals is just huge I mean, even a lot of cruelty is, I would say, ignorance, I think, you know. Yeah. Um, but one thing that when people talk about like cruelty that occurred to me as you were talking, and this is probably indicative of a lot of the people that we work with, is I have so much more compassion for, for animals <laughs> than I do for people. Mm -hmm. And actually, started with the lambs, one of the things I've started doing is when I imagine these horrible I, I try not to think about these things I really try not to think about them but if if I can actually take an animal situation and replace it with humans it doesn't seem that bad mm -hmm. like you know it's almost like a, just because there's little puppy eyes everything just takes on such a heart-wrenching quality but like if I look at those lambs and I replace them with limping children I don't have the same reaction I don't know. I do not. I mean, that's not to say I'd go and break kids' legs or anything like that, but I don't have the same emotional reaction. It's almost like I am so sensitized to animals that I imbue so much meaning into 
and helplessness and emotion and all of this into their lives. Because if I replace it with a human, you know, it's not it's not great. I wouldn't see ch cruelty on anybody, but uh, it it helps me actually get in more perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what that says about me, Julia. <laughs> no, that's like when, you know, I've used this analogy of your piece of the pie, your piece of the pie into this entire world party to help humanity grow, re get reconnected, become one with source, whichever it may be. Your piece of pie is through animals. My piece of pie is through animals and trees or whichever, you know, like there's other people's pieces of pie are through children who have disabilities or who have childhood cancer. I have a cousin who works with very sick kids and she's amazing, you know? So it's, everybody has a piece of pie because we're all helping things evolve in our own certain way. And it doesn't, and this is where we as humans get tripped up. It's like, it's not good or bad. It's not woo woo or um, normal. Those are all labels we put on stuff. It's just our piece of pie. And that's how, that's how you, Kate, shine your light on the world. And that part is pretty cool, I think. <laughs> but I have to ask you, you reminded me when you were saying something, I got this little ping. So there's a llama that I have heard about in England that admit, like lots and lots of people are rallying to save. Have you heard anything about this? No, oh, I'd be interested to find out. I don't know. I just keep seeing the headlines and I see the headlines as more of like a, Oh, can you believe we have time of COVID yet all these people are helping them a lot, helping a llama. And I'm like, well, yeah, why wouldn't I help a llama? I mean, because we're, I would resonate with helping a llama. I resonate with helping yeah. animals. Yeah, much more than helping humans too, but that's my piece of pie. So I was just curious. No, I, I try not to see stuff like that because it inevitably ends up with a sad story. So yeah, I'm not good with that either. No. Yeah, sorry to share <laughs> mine <laughs> earlier today. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to put a warning on it. Right, you will. You do need to put a word. <laughs> Sorry. So thank you for joining us for another episode of Making Light. We're two humans being. I'm Julie Heert. That is Kate Fago. We were talking about how today uh, the animals are here to help us teach us things. I'm sure we'll come back to this topic. If you have any thoughts, questions, concerns about what we discussed, please put them in the comments and we'd be happy to address them at another time. Uh, we really want to hear from you. So give us feedback, subscribe to our channel, uh, promote us and watch for our space on Facebook and Instagram. And we will see you next time. Thank you so much for being here.